Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard their point. Now, hear the counterpoint on Libertarian Counterpoint Podcasts. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We have with us John Cameron, Richard Fields, and the Life Flight Helicopter. That'll be gone here in a second. <laughs> it's, you know, you live next to a hospital. You kind of have to deal with these kind of things. But speaking of hospital needs, crypto crash. It looks like the Biden administration is going to do a surgery on cryptocurrency, so to speak. Uh, what do you guys think about that? Good luck with that. Uh, the uh, fact that cryptocurrency is uh, international and pretty much hack proof, uh, I'm really curious as to how they'll they'll be able to do anything that uh, that uh, stops Bitcoin in particular. Now uh, that said, I think it's possible that they'll make it really really difficult, make life difficult for people that use cryptocurrencies. But I think you have to get past the excuses that Yellow's offered up, which are that it's uh, uh, it's only used by criminals and it's used by terrorists and, and you know, the, that old uh, trope, which is largely uh, uh, a, a false flag. It's, it's just a, a smoke screen. The reason that Janet Yellen doesn't like cryptos is because it offers an alternative for asset storage to the dollar, which is destined absolutely totally irreversibly destined to lose value uh, given the uh, Biden economic policies, which Yellen is enthusiastically enthusiastically uh, adopting and proposing that uh, be put into place. Hmm. So the federal government is particularly concerned that uh, people will be able to uh, escape uh, the dollar uh, when they are, in fact, destroying the dollar. They want inflation. They want inflation with a vengeance. They want inflation of, they've stated they want over 2% inflation. They really want in inflation in the 4 or 5 or percent or, or higher range, mm -hmm. simply because that's the only way of managing the federal debt, and they know it. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason that the uh, effort to uh, hamper crypto will probably fail is because there's a whole lot of people with a whole lot of money and a whole lot of influence on Capitol Hill that want crypto to succeed for the very reasons that the government wants it to fail, which is they want to have a place to store uh, assets uh, securely against inflation. Uh, and and I, I, I agree with everything Richard just said. It's, it's strange about Yellen, you know, her, her, you know, she, She's always been a politician. Anybody that has that sort of job, the sort of job she's had, or primarily politicians. But she's in, in uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Enthusiastic favor uh, of uh, programs and ideas that she was absolutely dead set against ten years ago. And um, the you know cryptocurrency again. Uh, the whenever the government wants to uh, create a policy, what they do is they throw the fear thing out there. You've got, I'm not saying that people aren't dying of this, the pandemic, but the pandemic allows for an awful lot of uh, uh, stepping all over uh, individual liberties and rights that are, are guaranteed in our constitution for, because of a temporary emergency. They tried it with uh, uh, global warming or climate change or whatever in the hell they're calling it nowadays. And, and, uh, you know, it's uh, that didn't fly. You know, basically that was thinly disguised socialism. They've tried to float socialism as socialism, and and uh, those candidates met with other than a few safe districts resounding failure. So this, um, you know, labeling the cryptocurrency as a uh, uh, a way for people to finance terrorist acts uh, is is a way to scare people into if they're still believing that, uh, allowing for, for regulation. of The problem is it's cryptocurrency is cryptocurrency, as Richard pointed out. So I don't know how the hell they're going to regulate it unless they, they find a way to, uh, you know, uh, hack blockchain. And the reason cryptocurrency works and is so valuable now is because you can't hack it. Now, anything created by man can be... You know, any security system can be reached, breached, any, any computer program can be hacked and all the rest of that. So, you know, the nice thing about things like cryptocurrencies is that they, uh, smart, good people who see a need, 
create something, and then governments chase after it, trying to destroy it because it increases freedom. And if you know if they manage to crack the the current iterations of crypto, then somebody will create even more of one. So we have a double benefit of cryptocurrency. We have improving technology, improving security. Well, that's triple, and and money that uh, is pretty much inflation proof. And and I've you know, Richard, you and I remember, and, and James, I think you remember inflation. Inflation was bad. I remember when we had a a um, head of the Fed with some with some um, cojones. Can I say balls on the show? Yeah. Anyway, say stones. Yeah. Stones. Stones. I can say stones. Okay. Um, and Jimmy Carter tried to do the same thing with a pittance, with a pittance of the national debt that we have now, and and the uh, Volcker was it Volcker? Yeah, Paul Volcker. Paul Volcker Paul, said, but said, uh-uh, smoking a cigar and crank interest rates up to, to I don't know, try, 15%. I think, 15%. I remember selling jumbo CDs with a 17% yield. And I remember people, when interest rates started coming back down, people calling me up begging, crying to get that same rate, and it's gone down 1% in a day. So this is all good. Crypto's good. Government's not going to get at it. And uh, we've got to have checks and balances to those central banks because they sure are just printing money. Yeah. Well, the way they'll get at it is they'll tax the living crap out of it when you when you go to cash it out. Mm -hmm. And that's the way they'll get it is yeah. ultimately my feeling. So we've talked about freedom a lot there. Switzerland has put a referendum on the ballot to take away the power the government has taken during the coronavirus pandemic, as your panicdemic, as you uh, like to call it there, John. So okay. is the... Is the population, the general population, switching gears on this? Are they finally seeing that the government has exceeded, stepped over their authority? Switzerland has a really interesting form of government. It's uh, probably the closest thing that we have to uh, a great pure democracy, but with uh, lots of limitations on what the government can do. And one of those limitations is their uh, referendum system, which uh, essentially uh, negates the power of parliament uh, in Switzerland to do whatever Parliament wants to do, and that's what's happened here. Parliament has not nearly as, as drastically as the rest of Europe or the United States, but they have uh, initiated uh, crackdown, lockdown uh, uh, initiatives. The people don't like it, uh, and I think it's they have to get 80,000 or something like that signatures within 100 days to re reverse a law of Parliament. They've done it. It's going to a referendum, and it looks like, uh, I don't know what the the polling would suggest, but there's a you know obviously a chance that the the good citizens of Switzerland will say to hell with your lockdowns, uh, Parliament. We are not going to put up with that. I think that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah and, and Richard brought up something, a uh, good point that that uh, yes, Switzerland is very close to a pure democracy, and there's there are huge protections for individual liberties in, in the constitution their constitution is a little less structured but uh they're they're i'm not saying hardcore libertarians because switzerland basically isn't is an army it doesn't have an army um now there's a reason that it's not just neutral because everybody benefits bit from it being neutral it's neutral and sacrosanct because it'd be a tough nut to crack um and, and you know those people value individual liberty, and they they just won't give it up. And they know that governments are not the cream doesn't rise to the top in government. And um, you know that it it uh, they they know that for sure, and they try to keep government away from from um, you know out of their pockets. So I think it'll probably pass, even though they've only recently um, done a lockdown. You know, it said that uh, sending people home, closing non-essential businesses, gathering smaller than five because they had a, uh, you know, spike um, recently. So there, I think, uh, you know, Germany has shown, Germany's more federation of states like the U.S. that uh, people are, are tired of it, especially when study after study after study comes out saying that lockdowns don't do any good and they do irreparable harm instead. Switzerland is a really good example of a, of a country that uh, is doing what government should do in a lot of respects. Mm -hmm. They are multicultural, multi-ethnicities. Multi, uh, multi they, they, they don't have a national language. There is no Swiss language because there, there, is, a Swiss a mix, language. there is no Swiss language. It's a mixture of uh, French, Italian, and Germans. 
And as anybody who has studied history knows, the French, the Italians, and the Germans have been fighting among each other for millennia. But in Switzerland, they all get along. Mm. And uh, one of the reasons Switzerland is uh, impervious to outside attack is the fact that it's a mountain republic. But the second reason it's impervious to outside attack is because every adult male, and probably female at this point, uh, is required, not allowed, but required to have a fully automatic weapon uh, at the ready, fully stocked with ammunition in their home. Uh, yeah, and if fine. anybody tries to yeah. invade Switzerland, they're invading, they're, you know, they're fighting not an army, but the entire population who is very well armed and uh, in a very strong uh, mountain defensive position. I think Switzerland, uh, if, if you're going to have a government, Switzerland's uh, model is extremely good. And I think they're demonstrating it once again. Yeah, well, I think that you can take the COVID seriously without sacrificing basic human rights and you know, the proper roles of government. I, you, you, those two things are not mutually exclusive, which leads us to our next story. The recession and unemployment, there is looking at it might cause more deaths than COVID over, over time. Over an extent of the next five years, you might actually get more deaths from unemployment, you know, suicides, drug overdoses, all the various things that come with this desperation and despair, you know, rather than the 500,000 where we might end up with COVID over the course of the year. And so it's yeah. a tragedy. This is something that we've been preaching, uh, you know, since back last spring, that, that the lockdown is worse than the, than the virus. What's interesting about this study is that it is done by people at Duke, uh, Harvard Medical School and uh, Johns Hopkins Business School. We're talking about uh, the elitist institutions of the United States, the Ivy League schools, uh, the you know the most respected uh, among the elites institutions that we have, coming to the obvious conclusion that the uh, lockdown is going to be more lethal than the than the virus. And uh, you know they're they're saying, well, you know, we can mitigate it by all of the uh, public. Uh, by, by all of the bailouts and so forth. But the point is that it's the establishment coming to the realization that what they have done is more dangerous than what they are trying to uh, protect us from, supposedly. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, I think it's, a, you know, it's, it's an extremely interesting uh, development. I uh, suspect that it's going to get very, very little um, traction in the mainstream media for the simple reason that it violates the uh, the uh, the popular uh, accepted trope. Yeah. Well, they came up to the conclusion that was opposite from what they were clearly looking for when they started. And yet they were still, yes. you know, they were scientists enough to say, hey, this is kind of, now they did try to kind of play it, downplay it a little bit, but they were at least scientists enough to say, well, here's what we actually found. And so you got to give them credit for that. And and that the, what they didn't extrapolate was um, the, the long-term, they, they talked about unemployment and the impact of poverty and all the rest of that. But what they didn't take into account, uh, they didn't reach outside the U.S. when they talked about this. They talked about, I think, was it a million lives over or a million half lives over 17 years or something like that. They didn't talk about the tens of millions of uh, people who aren't U.S. citizens, the poorest of the poor, uh, because depending on you look at who you look at, the WHO or the World Bank or, or other think tanks, uh, somewhere between 100 million and 200 million people worldwide have been pushed into poverty uh, where they have less than $2 a day to live on, which is the kind of poverty that kills and shortens lives. So if you add that in, you're probably talking another over the same 17 year span, they're looking at another 50 million deaths. So, uh, and we know that the, um, the, the deaths attributed to uh, the panic virus, or the, the, as one place calls it, the CCP virus, the Chinese Communist Party virus, or who, whatever you want to call it, are, are inflated, and that the number of cases are deflated, because all of the numbers state you know, somewhere between three and ten times as many people have it, and we're not even going to go into the sleight of hand that hospitals and, and governments are doing talking about, you know, the, the numbers. So, anyway, it's... it's uh, you know, you talk about there was another study, Barrington, that came came out months and months ago, and these are people from Stanford, Oxford, and Harvard who said flat out that that lockdowns are bad. You know, you you protect the you protect the weakest people who are most at risk, and let the rest of the world go about its business. So, uh, but will the elites listen to science? That is the question. 
Well, no, they, well, they only listen to the science that they cherry pick. Yeah, they want to hit, listen to the science they want us to. As we came on the air this morning, uh, they just announced that Governor Newsom lifted the stay-at-home order for the whole state mm -hmm. just this morning, just as I woke up. So, you know, why? Who knows? I, they're just making stuff well, up at this put, point, they I think. Up, they put up a graph of, uh, <laughs> of, the, of the downward trend in uh, ICU. And yeah. nobody can get the information. Uh, you, you can't even get the information about what processes the state is using to categorize the different tiers. There's no scientific validity to the, the cherry picking they've done. Air, you know, you can get on an airplane, a little box in the sky with trapped air and fly somewhere, but you can't go to church. You can't have outdoor dining. They're closing national parks because apparently three people walking on a trail are going to die from. I mean, it's 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 the least scientific piece of science that's been shoved down the throat of the American people since uh, global warming. Hey, since yeah. using what did they, they used to use radio scopes to put your shoes on, right? To put to measure your shoes. Back in the old days, they put radio scopes. You know, you stick your foot into a radiation box and the guy could look down and see and get your shoes properly sized. Mm -hmm. Of course, they radiated your shoes and people's foot fell off and this poor salesman would lose their jaws because they're sitting there around, around radiation all day long. But hey, we listen to the science. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, well, and you know, if you want to, if you want to throw out radioactivity, plutonium has this, has this, let, let me, let me rant for 30 seconds, 45, take 45. All right, here we go. Supposedly is the, the most deadly substance on the planet. Uh, and one tiny speck of it, uh, an ounce of plutonium would kill a billion people. It's all garbage. There was a physicist who said he would sit and eat as much plutonium if Ralph Nader at the time would eat another supposedly innocuous thing that would have killed him on the spot. The same weight. And he said, and I'll be fine. And you're going to die. And Nader would go nowhere near that bet. So science... This, even though we've turned out some great scientists and a number of wonderful Nobel laureates, we pay no attention to science in this country. 45 seconds. <laughs> well, the desire to do something often leads to greater consequences, which brings us back to California. Is U-Haul released a study that says California is the number, was the least likely place for a one-way U-Haul trip, and we're like third in leaving. I forget exactly where it said we were leaving, but we were high in people leaving the state and very last in people coming to the state. Yeah, we're in the great company of uh, Illinois and New York in this regard. It's the states with the highest taxes, the most regulation, the most uh, uh, oppressive governments that people leave. People are voting with their feet and going to places that are a lot more friendly uh, government-wise, like uh, Idaho and uh, Texas and uh, Florida and uh, in Tennessee, which is number one right now. Mm. And what's strange is that, that Idaho went from number 11 down to number 30. Maybe they finally erected a fence to keeping people from <laughs> California out. But here's a study I'd like to see, and I haven't seen it, because U-Haul uh, is for people of basically limited means or they're super tight-fisted or they have strong backs or a lot of friends. Uh, but what I want to see is uh, corporate paid moves and people have the wherewithal to... Uh, to actually pay a mover to come over. That's, you know, people like Richard, you know, the wealthy, um, who, uh, who move and have a professional moving service to it. I wanna see that number because I think what you're gonna see is that number is through the freaking roof. I don't think it will be even remotely close that corporations are fleeing in droves. And these are places that when they relocate people, they pay for the move. You know, military does that, you know, it's, or else you couldn't have a military career. And they've already forced the military out of California, which might be a good thing. So I think if we saw that number, it would be even greater. We know what uh, Elon Musk has moved his headquarters out. He's leaving a factory here. Years and years ago, Intel said it would never add another job in the state of California. And this was like 15 years ago. Uh, like, like all thieves, um, California is going to kill the goose that laid the golden egg, and then um, we'll see what happens. Yeah, they're kind of determined to kill the California, the California dream. It's yeah. it doesn't don't understand why. But talk about uh, killing dreaming. 
the transit unions are pressuring the Department of Homeland Security to put give America a no ride list. So apparently they can't ride a train or a Greyhound bus if the unions don't want you to. Or, uh, or probably the subway. Yeah. yeah. Or the subway. How in the hell is that even going to work? I don't even. <laughs> it won't. So, <laughs> well, the no fly. I mean, the no fly list is. I mean, a monkey could get past the security in an airport. They have talk about lack of science. The the uh, number of containers with three ounces in them. I could refresh my chemistry for twenty minutes, and and come up with a way to to go around that to get something deadly on board. I mean, it's just it's crazy. It's crazy. And then you put in more infrastructure and all the rest of that. It's like it, this is this is as specious as the. LA County uh, Teachers Union in LA County demanding that all children be uh, vaccinated against the, the coronavirus prior to school reopening. So yeah, I, 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 I'm old enough to remember when uh, Cubans would hijack airplanes and say, "Fly my, fly me to, fly me to, fly me back to Cuba." Yeah, the Cuban exiles, whatever. And back that was back in the what 60s, 70s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and nobody, nobody, nobody panicked. Nobody had a, an issue. I mean, they I would fly to Cuba, drop them off, and fly everybody else home. No, no big deal. Mm. Uh, but it was a, a, an actual hijacking taking place. Mm -hmm. Now, because the hijackers are crazy enough to fly into a building, uh, allegedly, we en we end up with uh, with uh, all of these ridiculous uh, laws on how to fly or who who can fly an airplane under what conditions. Uh, and and the you know the, as you say the uh, the screening process is nothing but kabuki theater. It's meant to, to make us feel secure. It has nothing to do with actually being more secure. It's relatively easy for it would be relatively easy to to bypass all of their all of the all of the screening if you wanted to. But nobody's it's not happening. And the reason it's not happening is because the the threat is really not there. Uh, and likewise, the threat on surface transportation is really not there. The people who went to the Capitol, while they were stupid as all get out to uh, supposedly stage an insurrection, it was just a bunch of yahoos, uh, you know, running through the Capitol and putting their feet on Nancy Pelosi's desk and saying, "What heroes we are!" They were crazy. They were. They were silly. It was nonsense. Uh, but it's going to be used by the Democrats for the next 10 or 15 or more years as uh, an example of, of a, uh, a rebellion against the government, yeah. uh, which, you know, it may have been at a very, very superficial level, but it was never serious. It could never could have been serious. Yeah. I mean, have they uh, been able to capture the congressman? And what would they have done with them? I mean, it's, it's, it's doomed to fail. They were going to execute them, Richard. That's I mean, what, was, that's what just, the liberals it was just, think. It was just sheer stupidity all yeah. the way around. No, oh, no, it's it's uh, stupid. It, here, just to talk about the, the – I didn't mean to interrupt, and I did. Do you want to finish, Richard? I'm sorry. I well, go ahead. So, I'm just getting myself. I'm just getting myself banned from YouTube and Facebook yeah. and Twitter. Well, here, and here's I probably some, here's need something. to stop before, before, I, before I get that far. Here's something that I would like you all to do. This is your homework assignment. I know I can't really assign you homework, but you find a good estimate of the crowd size uh, at uh, on January. Was it the sixth? And I forget because election day is such a joke. I don't even remember what the day is uh, or the day that that the, the imperial president is supposed to be, you know, given his throne and scepter. Um, you can't find anywhere. You cannot find I. You know, I, I used three or four different search engines. I tried DuckDuckGo. You cannot find an accurate crowd number for that crowd. Now, what you'll find is the number of people that were permitted. The permit was for 5,000. They expanded it to 30 or something like that. That was a ton of people when you look at the pictures. You look at those pictures, and, and counting crowds is a science, uh, and it's done all the time. And um, they have algorithms for it and all the rest of that. But but I have spent an hour, maybe yeah, half hour, um, bit bopping around the web trying to find an accurate number. Out of that, some people say there was a million people there. There are some people who are there who say there was a million people there. But you can't get a number. Why can't you get a number? Why is that number out there? Because 
uh, what it will dramatically show is there is an awful lot of people pissed off about that election. Now, let's say there was only 50,000 people there, which would be a small number. Uh, a couple hundred of them uh, were stupid enough to be let into that building to cause mischief. The question is, who let them in? The liberals think it was a uh, radical conservative congressman. Uh, I think it's part of Kabuki theater because having people take getting to take pictures of, of people with their feet up on Pelosi's desk. I would want to take a, three or four showers if I sat in Pelosi's chair and put my feet up on her desk. That's what I'd be concerned with. Um, that's the question. It's going to be interesting to find. And I don't think we'll ever know. So let the theater commence. Well, let it seems to me. Go up. Yeah. It seems to me that that whole event shows that we actually don't need to do anything. They gin themselves up for two months and that's the best they came up with. That's it. They, they blew their whole- Yeah, and all, all of this is not to say that Trump was not soundly defeated. Sure, there was election yeah. fraud, there's fraud in every election, but enough fraud to swing the election the other way, highly doubtful. Yeah. Uh, and he was a, a petulant loser and uh, you know probably should be impeached. I would be in favor of his impeachment, but, but, uh, but it's kind of after the fact, it's kind of beside the point. Uh, the only the only benefit to his impeachment and being barred from uh, further holding office will be to uh, remove that embarrassment from the Republican Party, mm -hmm. and that may be uh, may or may or may not be a good thing for the country as a whole. Mm. Yeah, and I think uh, you know some of the something is lost in this. You know, I I think you know Trump's an idiot. The fact that he really he got elected when everybody knew he was an idiot shows how pissed off the country was around uh, the entrenched, you know, we call them the deep state. I don't know what you want to call it, the, the, the Beltway, Beltway bunglers. Uh, and he, he got more of the popular vote than, than Obama did. So the fact that a few more people voted than the election got him elected. And if you pulled the, the people, uh, the New York vote and the California vote out, uh, you know, no, no non-socialist candidate is ever going to win the popular vote in this country, except for if it hadn't been for the panic demic, there is no political expert that wouldn't state categorically that, that Donald Trump would have won re-election by 15 points. Without the panic demic, he's in office, and he almost was in office with the panic demic, which lets you know that there's still an awful lot of upset people in this country. Yep. Yeah, well, that, 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 there is an awful lot of upset people because the government yeah. fails to work, and we're going to have John, to leave it at that, Richard. We are out of John time. John Brennan thinks we're, we're we're terrorists. You know what can I say? Yeah. yeah. Hey, you know that's what we. Did you we, just say we, we're terrorists? Don't say that we, when I'm saying that. Right that. at the end of the show, come, you cannot do that to us. Now I have to extend it. <laughs> we are out of here. Thank you, everybody, for watching. You can catch us at libertarianpowercounterpoint.com, and you can catch all of our podcast episodes over there. Thank you for watching and good evening. Goodbye from the peaceful resistance. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.